Anyways, can I say Happy New Year again? Well, if you have a Bible, please get it out to Mark chapter 6. We're going to begin at verse 31. And when you get there, just give me an amen. Just tell me that you're there. Amen. Oh, you're there quick. And if you don't know where it is, it, it's after Genesis and before Revelation. Amen. <laughs> okay. Can I read? Okay. And he said to them, Come aside by yourselves to a deserted place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. So they departed to a deserted place in the boat by themselves. But the multitude saw them departing, and many knew him and ran there on foot from all the cities. They arrived before them and came together to him. And Jesus when he came out, saw a great mul multitude and was moved with compassion for them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. You know, I, um, I look around today and it seems like we're still sheep without a shepherd. You know, I, I, I don't know if you read about all the shootings in Chicago or maybe you heard about uh, policemen being shot and people dancing in the street over the whole thing. It shows me how lost we really are. You know, I look for leadership, uh, and maybe you do too, from politics. But if it wa it's almost like a joke these days, it seems. And if it wasn't so serious, it, 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 it wouldn't be funny. Because politics don't really give me any hope. I don't think the United Nations, or Black Lives Matter, or, or more gun control, or even, I don't, don't get me wrong, even the next president isn't going to necessarily save America. The only one I know who can save America is Jesus Christ. But I look at all of us, and a lot of us, no one here, of course, there's a lot of lost sheep out there. And we're a nation that have turned our backs on the shepherd. You know, I don't find the answer in science either. With all our great advances in science and all our great knowledge and learning, it just seems we've learned how to kill each other much more effectively. And with science's best thinking, they say human life, life has no real significance or no real meaning. I read an article not too long ago about high school kids at a summer camp that were given aborted fetus brains to dissect. Because to science, an unborn child doesn't mean anything. I look at a higher education to give me hope, but it doesn't. Our universities are, are, I hate to say this, but seminaries for left-wing philosophies. They teach young people to follow the, the politi politically correct crowd. And heaven help you if you happen to say something against one of the professors. You know, I, I, I did that once in college. It was the only class I ever failed in college. It almost cost me another year of college because I had to take the class over. But, you know, here I'm sitting in a class and the professor's just saying, if you believe in God, you're an idiot. So I decided to call him an idiot, which really made me the bigger idiot. But uh, it didn't work out really well for me in that class. But, you know, I guess my point is if you really want to see fascism these days, go to a college campus. They'll tell you what to think and how to act. And with all our science and educational advancements. How's the world looking these days? Yeah, we have our nice homes, and we have our toys to play with, but answer me this. Why is it that this is the first year, at least last year was, the first year that more young people died in drug overdose than car accidents? Our text says Jesus looked out at the people and said they were a sheep without a shepherd. But then it goes on to say he had compassion on them. And you know, that tells me that he cares for you and that he cares for me. And no matter what you are going through today, he knows what you need. See, God doesn't give us a perfect world to live in. 
But in the midst of all the craziness, he does his work. He does his business in us and through us. And he works his will in your life. You know what the question is, though? Will you trust him? Will you trust him through it? Let me read on. So he began to teach them many things. Look down at verse 35. When the day was now far spent, his disciples came to him and said, this is a deserted place, and already the hour is late. Send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. Now, he gives them a test right here. Verse 37. But he answered and said to them, you, he's talking to the disciples there, give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something, something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. And here's, here's my point. In a sense, they only found some scraps of food when it comes to feeding 5,000 people. It almost seems like a bad joke for Jesus to say, well, why don't you feed everybody with five loaves and two fish? But you see, with Jesus, not having enough with Jesus is more than enough, if you catch my drift. And maybe you're sitting here today and your marriage isn't enough. Maybe your life isn't perfect. Maybe your child or, or maybe your grandchild isn't very perfect. Maybe your health, maybe your finances aren't enough. But you know what? We still need to give thanks to the Lord and thank him for the little things, for the scraps. And when you can praise him for the little things, that's when he'll raise you up and give you more. That's when the real miracles happen. You know, I remember, and maybe some of you have heard of Corrie Tin Boone. You know, she thanked God. Get this. She thanked God for the lice and the fleas in the concentration camp that she was in with her sister. Why? Because the guards wouldn't come into the barracks while she, while she was having Bible studies leading people to Christ. And because she was thankful, and because her, well, because God decided to use her, because, there was a paperwork error. I don't think of the Germans as making paperwork errors. But the Lord worked it out that there was this error, and they just let her go. And she shared God's love all over the whole world. Amazing. Amazing. Let me say this. God can take the scraps of your life, the mistakes. God can take the hurts from your life and do a miracle with them. He can take what you might consider a bad joke. Five loaves, two fish, right? Lice. A lousy job. And bless you with it. And bless others through you. And I can look back at my life and see where Jesus took my mistakes, my failings, my past hurts, and he turned them into some of my greatest blessings. It's easy to look back at life and say, well, God is unfair. Life is unfair. But you have a choice whether to let those hurts define you or you can use them to grow and to bless other people. It's your choice. Jesus can turn your crosses into crowns. I believe that. Let me read on. Then he commanded them to make them sit down in, in groups on the green grass. Verse 40. For they sat down in ranks, in hundreds and in fifties. And when he had taken the five loaves and two fish, he looked up to heaven, blessed, and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fish he divided among them all. So they all ate and were filled. You know, in the Greek, the word filled is the word, it really means glutted. It's sort of how you felt on Christmas Day when you overate. No one did that? You know, you're not, it's not good to lie in church. 
Or when you go to a buffet and you eat too much. That's what that was like. They, they were glutted. But think about this for a second. The number 12. There's 12 apostles, 12 tribes of Israel, 12 elders sitting around the throne in heaven, 12 pearly gates. In Jewish numerology, the number 12 represents completeness. It also represents God's power and authority. Remember that. Verse 44. Now those who had eaten the loaves were about 5,000 men. Now men really means households. It doesn't count women or children. So there could have been up to 50,000 or more people there. And what Jesus was doing, he was showing that something greater than who in the Bible did the same thing. Remember? Moses. Something greater or equal to Moses was happening right there. In fact, he was showing that the prophecy was fulfilled in Deuteronomy 18.15. But the point I want to make here is Jesus thanked God for what he had, and he turned what wasn't enough into a blessing. And until you thank God for what's not enough, maybe your job that doesn't pay enough, or your relationship that isn't enough, or the opportunities in your life that aren't enough, he's not going to turn it into more than enough. In Philippians chapter 4, you remember that one. It says, be anxious for nothing, but with all things, with prayer, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will what? Guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. See, prayer and thanksgiving are your weapon are your weapon against fear and against life's struggles. It's not just about thanking God and praising him. It's for you. It's for your safety and for your peace. Thanking God and having a spirit of thanksgiving in your heart is for your mental and spiritual health. It's a wall and it guards your soul. And that's where the real miracles happen. When we can thank God for the things in our lives. You know, you want to change the next year? Want to have a good year? Hope so. You wake up every morning in the next month or two and write down three things that you're thankful for. And I'm telling you, it will change your heart. And especially if you're struggling with those kinds of things. Trust me. But there's more. Let me read the text. He looked up to heaven, blessed, and broke the loaves. Somehow... The miracle happened in the breaking of the loaves. And it's in the breaking, follow me, that the miracles happen. Remember what did Jesus say? He took the bread and he broke it, right? And said, this is my body broken for you. And that, that broken body was the salvation of the world, was it not? The same broken body, Jesus said, this is the bread of life. Jesus takes seemingly useless, less than, broken things, broken people, and uses them for his glory. God uses what's been broken. He took a shepherd boy, right? He wasn't even named with his brothers, and made him, well, you might remember his name, King David. He took a slave, a convict, who spent a good portion of his life locked up in prison to save a nation, to save the whole eight parts of the ancient world. And he even saved his brothers. Remember his name? Joseph. He took, he took a murderer who ran and hid from God until God ultimately broke him after 40 years in the wilderness and he used this same murderer to teach us about God's morals and God's law. Remember his name? Moses. And God used a baby born in an obscure village from a, a little of nothing people, from a dingy little town in the middle of nowhere. Trust me, I've been there. And he used a little baby from that town to save the whole world, and that was Jesus. And here's a strange little 
addendum to everything. The child, which it says in one of our other texts, who brought the fish and the loaves, he wasn't even counted in the 5,000, but he was the one that God used for the miracle. See, God uses less than perfect lives. People who have been hurt, people who've been divorced, people who've had illness, people who are, are less than for his glory. And he will use you if you let him. He will use you. He used me, a kid who was living on the street. But I guess, well, let me ask you this. Have you been broken by life's circumstances? Or, let me get deeper. Do you remember when God broke you? Do you remember that? What does the scripture say? Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. See, the blessing is in the breaking. Maybe God wants to use you today. Can you thank God for the, the breaking or the losses in your life? You ever had a broken heart? Broken dreams? Let me say this. Every time, every time God humbled me and broke me of my pride and my arrogance or my self-will, it became a blessing in my life. Because it's in the breaking that the multiplication or the miracle happens. Let me read some more. Verse 45. Immediately, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side, to Bethsaida. And while he sent the multitude away, and he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the, on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea and would have passed by them. You know, sometimes when you're following Jesus, he will send you out to some places that might be kind of hard. It says it was the fourth watch. Guys, that's three in the morning. They've been rowing all day against the wind and getting nowhere. Things were getting tough. Are you struggling against the wind today? Are you rowing against some hard things? Do you feel like you're getting nowhere? Well, let me say this. Jesus has a word for each and every one of you, for all of us, really, who struggle. Verse 49. And when they saw him walking on the water, they supposed it was a ghost and cried out. For they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Friends in Christ, the word for you today is don't be afraid. Is there someone here that these words speak to this morning? Don't be afraid. My point is, he sees you in your storm. It might be three in the morning, and it seems like Jesus is away on a mountain, but he saw them struggling. And he sees you in your struggles. He knows where you are. He knows what you're facing. He knows what you're going to face this next year. And he will give you help. He will give you peace. And my point is, can you praise him for that? Will you praise him for that? See, it says God is present in the praises of his people. Now, as a pastor and as a counselor, I've gone to some pretty tough places, scary places. Uh, and let me say this, the Lord has always been with me, in spite of me. You know, I, I've been to the craziness in the inner city. I remember one time I was in Oakland, and I was doing a counseling session in a, in a little 
a little house in East Oakland. The woman, it looked like she had just pulled a needle out of her arm and she was nodding off. There was no furniture in the house, but one mattress in the center of the floor. We were sitting on the floor as the rats were running by. But God was there. And he was with me and he protected me. I, you know, I've been to places like Nepal. Uh, we, we arrived there the day of the second earthquake. They closed the airport. It was crazy. It was, it was nuts. The electricity went out. There was no gas, no fuel for cooking. The, the houses and churches were, had crumbled to the ground because of this earthquake. But it was in the midst of that craziness that I saw Jesus in a sense. Friends in Christ, what I mean by that is it was through the gifts of Christians, just like you, that churches were rebuilt and homes were rebuilt and lives were changed. My point is Jesus showed up in the middle of that storm. And when, you have, when you're in the storm, it forces you to depend on faith and the grace of God. And you know what the weird thing was in the midst of all of that? Now, Nepal is a Hindu nation. But see, the Hindus weren't helping. You know why? Because they thought it was because of their karma that the earthquake happened and that 10,000 people died. They thought their gods were mad at them because they allowed, allowed Christians to come into the country. And they were being punished. You see, you can say whatever you want about other religions, but ultimately Hinduism is a religion, and there are many religions who are based on fear. But what did Jesus say? Don't be afraid. It's I, right? And my point is, many times we don't see Jesus in the midst of the storm. Sometimes when we're in the middle of the storm in our lives, we think it's the enemy coming to attack us. But in reality, it's Jesus doing his work in us and moving us to another place in our lives. Have you ever come to the point in your life where you thought life was getting the best of you? You ever got to the point where you thought, well, maybe God really doesn't care about me. Maybe, he, maybe God's forgotten me. Or it feels like Jesus is far away. You remember the disciples? The other storm they were in, in the middle of the lake? Jesus was asleep in the front of the boat. And these great men of faith, you know what their first words were when they woke up Jesus? I'll quote it to you. Why don't you care? Why don't you care? You ever felt like that? Lord, why don't you care? I've done that. But what they were inferring was, Jesus, what, you brought us out here to die? In the middle of a storm? Or what about Martha and Mary? Remember Martha and Mary when, when Lazarus died? And Jesus arrives sort of a day late, right? And their first words were, you know, Jesus, if you were here a day earlier, our brother wouldn't have died. I mean, were they blaming Jesus? It's because hurt. And ultimately, what we were talking about earlier, fear leads to anger. Who are you angry at in your life? Who can't you forgive? Or who hurt you? Or what's hurting you today? But get this. Remember what Jesus says to Martha and Mary? And I love these words. He says, only believe. Only believe and you will see the glory of God. See, it's in the middle of the storm that your faith is tested that your hope is attacked. See, being a Christian, I, I think a lot of Christians get this wrong. Doesn't mean you're not going to face storms. But the storm isn't really what's going around the boat. It's what's going on in our minds and in our thoughts. If the enemy is really going to attack you, he's going to attack you how you think. He's going to attack you in your faith. He's going to attack you in what you hope for. Hebrews 12 says it like this. Faith is the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. If you look at that verse carefully, it says that faith 
supports hope. And when you lose your hope, your hope about life, that's when you lose your faith. And do you know what the opposite of faith really is? It's not unbelief. That's right, it's fear. It's fear. So I don't know what you're struggling with today, and all of us have struggles if we're human, but Jesus says, don't be afraid. Or in other words, he says, I got this. Look at verse 51. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure, and marveled, for they had not, get this part, for they had not understood about the waves. No. What does it say? They didn't understand about the loaves, which is kind of strange, because their heart was hardened. Let me explain a little bit. Let me ask, is, is your heart hardened by the world that you live in? Maybe your life is hard. I can accept that. Maybe you're afraid of getting hurt again in your life. But if you're afraid, it's going to rob your faith. God allows us to go through the storms. And I don't know what storms we might go through next year. That we might learn to trust him and put our faith in him. Too many times the storm, our fears, our prejudice control us. We don't want to believe. My point is, we don't want to believe that God would allow us to struggle with things like cancer. We don't want to believe that God would allow us to struggle with divorce or death of a loved one. In the struggle, we don't see Jesus. We don't want to see the truth. We don't see the big picture that God is still on the throne and in control. We think, Lord, well, why did you bring me here? We think, well, it's something evil, like the disciples. It's a ghost, right? And we're afraid. But Jesus says, don't be afraid, it's I. And sometimes the very thing that you might be praying against could be the will of God for your life. Maybe what you think is a threat or a ghost is a blessing in disguise. Have you ever been there? I have. We don't want to see it because our hearts and our minds sometimes are in the wrong place. Maybe we've been abused in our life and we expect to be abused again. We expect to get hurt again. But Jesus understands, and he is the one who calms the storm. But look at the text. It says, they did not understand. And here's the weirdness, the loaves. And I had this thought. As they're rowing in this boat against the wind, there's 12 baskets, which is interesting, 12 again, with them. One basket ultimately for each one of the disciples. Why does God mention 12 baskets again? Because the baskets are an evidence, an evidence of God's miracle in their life. It's an evidence of God's power and God's authority in the situation sitting right there in the stern or the nose of the boat. My point is, have you seen God work in your life? Is there a basket in your boat? Does that make sense? Has there been a time in your life where Jesus has provided for you when it looked like you had nothing, you said, God, get me out of this one, right? And God answered that prayer. And you might have praised him. Thank you, Jesus. I paid the rent or whatever the case may be. But then the storm comes and we forget. We forget about the baskets in our boat. We forget about the leftovers. I remember years ago, I was working, actually it was at Renee's father's church, big church in Orange County. And uh, I was a youth minister, but being a youth minister, um, I had other jobs to do. I remember I took the seniors out to, uh, I was their driver. And I remember one time we went to, if you know where Alvera Street is up in L.A., you know how they have all the little booths over there and they're selling little things, whether it's street tacos or, well, there was this little, there was this little straw hat. 
And, okay, I was in, not only was I working for the church part-time, I wasn't making a lot of money, such is life, and um, I was in seminary, and I'm standing there, and there's this little, this little, you know, basket-type hat. And my son was like one or two years old. And I'm standing there looking at it, and I'm just, I start praying. I said, Lord, I wish I had the seven dollars to buy, to buy the hat for my son. I just wanted, I was just like, come on, Lord, I just want to buy little Jake a present. And a lady comes up to me, a little lady, and she goes, you know what, why don't you buy that hat for your son? That's a basket in my boat. I wish I still had that hat. But sometimes God will answer those prayers, and they stay with you. And, but let me take it a little deeper. Sometimes he answers even no. And it's a basket in my boat. My father had cancer. And I prayed, oh, Lord, heal him, right? And God healed him. He took him home. And, but if it wasn't for the cancer, my father was a dogmatic atheist. If it wasn't for the cancer, my father would have never accepted Jesus Christ. And I might have only had three months with him as a Christian, But that's a, that's a loaf in my boat. That's a basket. Uh, that's, God was there. And he used it for his glory. Even if he said no to me. And I thank God for that. Because God is good. You know what the word, there's another name for God. Jehovah Jireh. You know what that means? The God who provides. My cup overflows in spite of me, friends. And here's the takeaway of this whole sermon. We need to look back and remember the blessings in our lives as we face the struggles for tomorrow. You need to have those baskets in your boat. You need to remember the answered prayers, the times that God blessed you, and I know that he has. What's your greatest fear today? Is it your relationships? Is it your job? Is it your health? A marriage? Is it children or grandchildren? Is it money? Is it global warming? I don't know. The question is, will you trust God? Will you remember his blessings in your life? Is there someone here who's at the end of their rope right now? Can you remember a time that he snatched you right out of trouble? Can you remember when God showed up? Can I get a witness of somebody here where he's done that in your life? Raise your hand, come on. Has God not done that for you? And he's done it for me. Christians, the end of the test of feeding the 5,000 was the storm. And the answer for all of it was the, the blessings in the boat. The point is God cared for me in the past. And he'll be with me in the future, whatever that future is going to be. Jesus said, I'm the bread of life, broken for you. Ultimately, he's the loaf in your boat, right? He's the one who calms the storm. He's the one who's gotten you through every single test you've ever had to face. And my point is, God blessed me when I had nothing. He blessed me when I lived in a van and I didn't even know him. He blessed me. I thought about this. I remember I used to, I lived in Orange and I used to go to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa when I first got saved. And I remember, get a load of this, I would hitchhike and get there. But you know what's really funny? I met this girl there one time when I hitchhiked. Her name was Renee. And that's how I met Renee of your church, Renee Bark. Although she wasn't Renee Bark then, she was Renee Didier. But the point being, if I wouldn't have trusted God hitchhiking that day to get there, I didn't know how I'd get back. But that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's really kind of funny. I guess what I'm trying to say is I can look back and see the leftovers of God in my life, his grace and his miracles. I can thank God when he shut doors in my life. 
And when he answered prayers, no. You know what? I'm reminded of an old song. Am I, can I play for you on the piano? And I'll close with that. Why should I be so discouraged? Oh, why do the shadows, shadows come? Why does my heart feel so lonely and long? for heaven and home for Jesus is my portion a constant help is he for his eye is on the sparrow and I know he watches he watches over me. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know he watches, he watches over me. Thank you so much. And I, I just want to say, he watches over you too. And he loves us. And he's going to love us through the next year. He's going to love us through all eternity. And if you're feeling alone, if you're struggling through the storm, God is with you today. And he'll be with you forever. Let's pray right now. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I thank you for this time. I thank you that you can speak to our hearts and that you can raise us up as if we are at the door of heaven. And we can remember the times you've, you've spoken to us and been in, in our lives and opened doors and closed them and brought us to this place that we are today. And we can step back and we can praise you for who you are and what you're going to do tomorrow because you are God. And we are going to worship you because we're your people and we love you. And we thank you that you love us. And Lord, if there's someone here who doesn't know you, Someone here who's in the middle of the storm, I just pray that they would say, Jesus, come into my heart. Touch me, Lord. I give my life to you. I let myself be broken for you that I might be lifted up. But we give you the praise and the glory. And we all say, amen.